According to the most recent estimates of the Energy Department, world energy demand is going to increase by 50% by 2035, largely because of increased consumption in China, India, and the rest of the developing world. Renewable energy will rise as a percentage of energy used to 15% from 10% by 2035, but that will not provide for the growing demand. The fossil fuel age will be extended for decades, says Yvonne Sandrea, president of the Energy Intelligence Group. I didn't name that group. A research publisher. Unconventional oil and gas are at the beginning of a technological cycle that can last 60 years. They are really in their infancy. Now, when we talk about unconventional oil and gas, we're talking about uh, fracking, uh, fracking for oil, fracking for gas. We're talking about things like the Niobrara Formation here in Colorado, the Bakken Formation in, uh, in North Dakota, uh, also uh, the, uh, for fracking for natural gas in the Marcellus Shale um, and in uh, and Pennsylvania and New York, although we hear about that all the time, actually. Colorado is still the number two state for fracking after Texas. Wow. Okay. Then uh, the other unconventional oil and gas that, that we all know about is uh, what, what the, what's called the, uh, the uh, oil sands or tar sands up in Alberta and the oil shale or tar shale here in Colorado on the west slope. So uh, let's hear about those things. The top rated climate scientist in the world, James Hansen from NASA stated, if we burn all the reserves of oil, gas, and coal, there is a substantial chance we will initiate the runaway greenhouse. If we also burn the tar sands and tar shale, I believe the, Ven the Venus syndrome is a dead certainty. Venus has a temperature of 450 degrees centigrade, 842 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead. It once held water, but the runaway greenhouse effect heated the planet so much that the water molecules were destroyed. The sun's energy hitting Earth is slightly more than half that of Venus. Burning the tar sands and tar shale could, over time, put Earth's temperature to around 225 degrees centigrade, or 437 degrees Fahrenheit, which uh, is, is hot enough to, to bake a pie. Now, the, the way that this happens is first the ice caps melt. Uh, the oceans start to warm up, and as they warm up, they can no longer hold as much uh, uh, CO2 as they do now. They change from a, a CO2 sink into a CO2 source. They start to bubble out CO2. The methane clathrates then, and the methane under the permafrost start to emit. That causes a pulse similar to the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. Uh, combined with the human-produced uh, greenhouse forcing, we shoot right past that uh, to a level that was experienced in the Permian period uh, 255 million years ago. And now, since then, the sun has gotten brighter. So we have an increased amount of solar radiation, increased amount of CO2, and water vapor coming off the oceans starts to produce what's called the water vapor feedback. The water vapor feedback uh, basically means the water is a greenhouse gas, more water vapor, more heat, more evaporation off the oceans until the oceans start to boil. The oceans begin to boil, the oceans boil away, uh, the Earth's temperature starts to rise above uh, 212 degrees Fahrenheit again, uh, and then that starts to bake the Earth's crust. The Earth's crust uh, contains a lot of limestone, uh, which then bakes and, and releases more CO2. Then the, uh, water, the water molecules start to break up, the hydrogen escapes off into space, and uh, the remaining oxygen combines with carbon in the crust to produce more CO2. And for, and for the remainder of the life of the solar system, the Earth would be a, a place similar to Venus, uh, with no life whatsoever. Uh, this is going to happen anyway, but only in about a billion years uh, without us. Uh, would it happen with us? We're at risk of causing this to happen. So uh, this is 
really important, I think, when people talk about the greenhouse effect, uh, and, and this goes back to Carl Sagan in the 70s, uh, discovered this possibility. This hasn't been talked about very much. I think it ought to be talked about because it's what they call an existential risk when you're talking about the, uh, the possibility that there would be no future generations. Uh, the cost would be much, much greater than any of these uh, smaller things like uh, Katrinas and Dust Bowls and the collapse of civilization and, and those kinds of things. Um, Joanne, yes. you had given this lovely process a name right at the start, which I missed. The Venus Syndrome. Venus Syndrome. Now look up, uh, James, James Hansen is the, the fellow who's done this analysis. He was a top uh, climate scientist at NASA, he left a couple of years ago to work full-time on stopping climate change. He'll probably be here May 13th for the Denver uh, World Renewable Energy Congress. There's also the American Solar Energy Society meeting, May mm -hmm. 13th through the 19th. Right, right. Well, definitely keep me in the loop about that, because I want to meet the guy. Um, okay. So, how do we stop this? Um, solar power. Uh, there's a, a model of the... Uh, uh, model of the world economy and environment called Limits to Growth, and that was put out in uh, 1972, 73, somewhere around there. Uh, recently there was an update done uh, that looks at, um, looks actually at the greenhouse effect. So if you run this model, uh, what you see is uh, basically uh, lots, of, uh, lots of greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere. Um, <coughs> Uh, population uh, growth uh, and big economic growth in the developing world countries uh, which causes a big greenhouse effect, lots of pollution, depletion of resources, you got peak oil and, uh, and, and climate change hitting you at the same time and a big, big, big population crash uh, somewhere between 2050 and 2070. We try a bunch of different scenarios, tweaking these parameters, and what do you get? Uh, the one way to keep this from happening is to build as much solar as, as we can right now. I mean, the good news from this model is that civilization collapses before we trigger the Venus Syndrome. When you think of civilization collapsing as good news, you know you've got a problem. So, um, so the, the only way to get past this is to start deploying all the renewables we can as quickly as possible. And given that we are at, at something called grid parity, where it's now cheaper to put up solar panels than to get your power from oil and coal and gas and, and fracking and all that stupid shit, um, you uh, basically, uh, we, we do have a chance. And uh, the people in this room, I'm very confident in uh, have a chance uh, to actually stop all these horrible things I talked about at the beginning of the talk and actually build a world where it's more equitable, where we're not getting our power from big centralized plants, where we can grow our own food, we can provide for our, our own power, and uh, live with a lot more uh, freedom and, and equity than we do in a world ruled by oil companies. So, solar gardener training. Any relation to the Occupy movement, Joy? <laughs> the, the Occupy movement, yes. Well, well, that's another great thing that's going on right now. And, and uh, you know, the, uh, um, look at how much trouble Dave had uh, getting a few solar panels up on a roof uh, that were financed by the community. That the uh, securities laws were put in there for a reason. They were, to, they were to keep unscrupulous stock dealers from going to grandma and taking all our money and running off with it in a carpet bag somewhere. And they do a pretty good job stopping that. But uh, what's happened now is they've given Wall Street a monopoly or a lock on investment. And when you look at what we're doing right now, we're, we're working with these big private equity funds that are you know, giving us the, the money to build these things and they're claiming the tax rebates and blah, blah, blah. Um, you've got this pie. This is all the money for investment in the U.S. 
This is private equity. So private. 4% and here is public equity. This is your stocks, your municipal bonds, your savings accounts, all of the things that are, are held by individuals rather than by large private equity funds. 96%. This is what we got to access here. There's huge amounts of money out there. There's trillions of dollars of money that the corporations are just sitting on right now. What are they doing with it? I don't know. They're spending it on uh, Congress people to stop uh, um, this climate stuff. But there is a, a, a large and growing group of people who are uh, funding things like uh, uh, these uh, solar arrays that are going up all over Colorado. and uh, uh, something called the Solar Panel Hosting Company, which is a good thing for us, since that's us. Uh, so, in, in order to access this uh, uh, public equity here, things like what uh, David is doing, uh, taking money out of big Wall Street banks and stock markets, and uh, putting it into solar gardens, uh, is and real gardens, for that matter, the slow money movement. Uh, I also think redeveloping foreclosures and rebuilding our neighborhoods in ways that don't require so much driving around is, is another great thing to do with some of this money. Um, all of these things um, can rebuild society in a way that, that doesn't uh, uh, cost as much. And I think, you know, the, the Occupy movement is sort of the shock troops they're in there going, hey, wake up, everybody. And then everybody's going, well, what do we do? And then we can tell them, okay, here's something better you can do with your money. And I think that, uh, you, you know what, uh, if I were the Wall Street people, I, w I wouldn't be pepper spraying those guys downtown. I'd be headed in here. <laughs> Bust us all because we, we have the, the, the real lever that could change the world here. Okay. So, what is a solar gardener?